Tonight at 10, the scale of Britain's housing crisis and the massive financial burden on local authorities. Figures obtained by the BBC show councils have spent more than £3 billion on temporary accommodation for the homeless in the past five years. Hello, you're going to have to sit up, please. We report on the plight of working families in need of affordable homes who find themselves trapped. There was no arrears that I had on my property, but even that didn't secure me from being evicted and having nowhere else to go because you get priced out of being able to move on. We have a report on the sharp rise in costs for local councils having to deal with an ever-increasing problem. Also tonight... It's chaos. It's stabbed people and shot people. A jury listens to the emergency call made after the MP Joe Cox was attacked as Thomas Mayer denies murder. A warning that NHS England needs a new funding settlement because patient demand has been underestimated. President Obama tells the German Chancellor that he expects Donald Trump to stand up to Russia if American values are infringed. And Sir Terence Conran shows us around the new home of the Design Museum, which opens next week. And here in the South, shameful and scandalous, the claims that care for the elderly is in crisis amid a postcode lottery over funding. And Portsmouth fined £15,000 for fielding understrength sides. Good evening. The acute shortage of housing in Britain has been underlined by figures obtained by BBC News. Local authorities, already under financial pressure, are facing a huge increase in the cost of dealing with the crisis. The figures reveal that councils in England, Wales and Scotland have spent more than £3.5 billion over the past five years providing temporary accommodation for homeless families. It means an increase of 43% over that period, and charities say that the number of people needing emergency shelter is rising at an alarming rate. Our social affairs correspondent, Michael Buchanan, reports now from East London. This is the front line of Britain's housing crisis. Your belongings need to go into storage, and then you come to us after the bailiffs have been. When we gave you the accommodation, you knew that you were going to have to travel for school. But what we need to do is we need to carry out an assessment and we need to look and see if there's any way that we can stop this eviction. Daily, dozens of people stream to this housing office seeking support and shelter. Each case a new challenge, needing a dispassionate answer. We will not be accommodating you today, so I do suggest at this moment you go back to your friends tonight and you come and see Solomon tomorrow to see what the decision will be. These are the people who decide who to house. We've got a family of five parents and three children that were evicted today. Strict rules are applied. Families with no rent arrears or savings are most likely to be helped. But such is the need that this year's budget has already been spent five months early. A lot of these people are in crisis point. They're losing their homes. They do not know what their next step is going to be. They are in a place in their life where they just don't know what to do and they're hoping that we're going to have the answers and we haven't always got the answers. So this is your room, okay. you've got your own bedding. This is yeah. Butler Court, a council-run homeless hostel. New arrivals get a single room with communal facilities. <laughs> 78 families can live here. Usually I'm full. Every night? Every night we're full. The hostel manager, Julie Muggleston, says the face of homelessness is changing. We've got educated people, people that are in uh, that are nurses. We've got teachers. We've had social workers here that just find because of because of the amount that the rent in private sector is just going through the roof, they no longer can afford. Hello, you're gonna have to sit up, please. Lucy Surridge is one of the working homeless. She's a full-time school chef but has spent nine weeks here with her two children. She became homeless when a landlady sold the property. Estate agents told Lucy she'd need an income of nearly £40,000 before they could rent to her. I think everybody sort of has that touch of, oh, it could never happen to me, because I always made sure that I paid all my bills on time. I wasn't in any rent arrears, council tax arrears. There was no arrears that I had on my property, but even that didn't secure me from 
being evicted and having nowhere else to go. In the past, we had uh, landlords falling over themselves to rent to us as a, as a local council. Barking in Dagenham is London's poorest borough, but it can no longer afford to house London's poorest people. The council leader told me lack of housing, rising rents and falling benefit levels have overwhelmed them. A ban on housing people more than an hour from here was lifted this week. What makes London great is the diversity of people. I believe that the working class, and I'm a working class lad, I believe that's what has given London its, its buzz, if you like. We're now saying that actually there are people in our community that we can no longer facilitate. And I never got into politics to say to people, we can't help you anymore. The figures we've gathered highlight the housing crisis in London and its increasing prevalence elsewhere in England. In Scotland, the cost of temporary accommodation has remained flat, but actually fallen in Wales, as fewer people are placed in emergency properties. Back at the housing office, another family need help, but no, they're not eligible. We can't assist you, we can't help you. They head off with a newborn baby, just £50 in their pocket. Where they'll sleep, even they don't know. Michael Buchanan, BBC News, Barking. Well, as Michael was underlining there, one of the causes of the housing crisis, um, which emerges from that report, is the lack of affordable housing. And today, new figures showed that the number of affordable homes being built in England has fallen to its lowest for 24 years. Let's talk to our home editor, Mark Easton, on that key thing, Mark, really, of affordable housing and the fact that there is such a drastic shortage. Absolutely. I think today's figures on affordable housing will have, will have led to a sharp intake of breath in, in Whitehall. They do make very depressing reading. Ministers will point out, you know, that there's often a bit of a dip around the start of a new parliament as, uh, as policies change, schemes get replaced. Housing is a cyclical business. But these are, as you say, the worst affordable home figures for decades. We managed to build just over 32,000 affordable homes last year, less than half what we built uh, the year before when it was uh, just just over 66,000. Now, you have to go back to 1991 for numbers as bad as that. And while the homes in question are technically affordable uh, because they're offered at below market rates, frankly, for, for many people, they still remain out of reach. Now, traditional council housing has not been a priority for this government. And today's figures show that in the whole of last year in England, they started building just 950 new social rent homes. And when you recall that at one time we were building 185,000 council homes in just one year, that's a big change. We do expect announcements in the autumn statement uh, and a housing white paper shortly afterwards. New schemes, I think, for both affordable homes to rent and buy. But for all the schemes, all the promises, all the rhetoric, these figures, frankly, are, are deeply disappointing. Uh, and I suppose, you know, you'd ask the question about the cost of dealing with it and, indeed, the cost of, of not dealing with it. Well, absolutely. We saw the, the, the huge human cost in, in Michael Buchanan's uh, report. The failure to provide the affordable homes we need has a financial cost, billions in emergency housing. And don't forget... £27 billion pounds a year is the, is the housing benefit bill pushed up by the high price of, of, of housing people. Frankly, the cost of housing is costing this country dear. Mark, thanks very much again. Mark Easton, therefore, is our home editor. Now, at the Old Bailey today, a jury has heard a recording of the 999 call made after the attack on the Labour MP, Joe Cox. A witness described the scene as chaos as uh, he urged the emergency services to pursue Thomas Mayer, the man accused of murdering the politician outside Burstall Library in West Yorkshire. Uh, Thomas Mayer denies murder. Our correspondent, Sarah Campbell, reports now from the Old Bailey. It's hell on this chaos. He stabbed people and shot people. A 999 call made moments after the killing. Despite fearing he would be targeted by the gunman, Darren Playford stayed on the phone, relaying vital information to the police. He's walking up where, love? Brown Hill Road. If they go, if they Brown. get a police car at Brown Hill Road, which is off of Freud Lane, if you get a police car at the top of there and at the bottom, you'll catch him. Within the hour, the police had arrested a local man, Thomas Mayer, on suspicion of murder. Joe Cox the 41-year-old MP and mother of two young children had been due to carry out a surgery in Burstall Library. The jury had been shown CCTV footage of Mrs Cox arriving by car. In the taxi behind was driver Rashid Hussein. 
Today in court, he described challenging the man who he'd seen stabbing the MP five or six times. The man pointed the knife at him and said, move back, otherwise I'm going to stab you. 16 eyewitnesses appeared in court today, some struggling to contain their emotions. Their accounts were strikingly similar, with all describing an attack as violent as it was quick, and many feared for their own safety. In Burstall Library that day, waiting to meet Joe Cox, was David Honeybell. On hearing a loud noise outside, Mr Honeybell described what he saw from the library entrance. He told the court, he just stood over her, cocked his gun and blasted her. Counsel for the prosecution asked what the man had done after that. He said he just walked away. With not a care in the world, he just walked away. Listening intently today in court was Thomas Mayer. He denies murdering Joe Cox. Sarah Campbell, BBC News. There needs to be a new funding settlement for NHS England, according to the head of hospital trusts, Chris Hobson, who says patient demand has been underestimated. Ministers have committed more than £8 billion of investment over the course of this parliament, but Mr Hobson says problems in social care and billions in projected uh, spending cuts mean that a new plan is now needed, as our health editor Hugh Pym explains. The NHS is running at full stretch. Patient numbers are rising faster than expected. Now hospital leaders are saying without new cash plans, care will suffer. Sure Here at Ipswich Hospital, managers say they're always looking for savings, but more funding is needed to sustain services. And as the money does get tighter and tighter, it's going to be more difficult for us to employ the staff, to spend the money in the right place. So I, my fear is that we will see waiting times particularly more challenged, and particularly as we go into the winter. Chris Hopson, Chief Executive of NHS Providers, representing trusts in England, said, We are asking for a new plan for the rest of the Parliament to finalise or confirm the NHS budget. If there are no changes, we'll need to set out what the NHS stops doing. Two years ago, Simon Stevens, head of NHS England, seen here on the right, agreed a five-year plan with George Osborne, who was then Chancellor. A gap between patient demand and NHS resources of £30 billion was predicted for 2020. So there was a commitment to £22 billion of efficiency savings and ministers promised an extra £8.4 billion. Hospital chiefs now argue the government needs to pay more. Can you manage? Okay. Just in your own time. It's not just the NHS. Social care funded by councils in England is under even yeah. greater pressure, as Lorna knows only too well. Her mother Celia is in a care home, but now despite okay. the doctors saying she's better off where she is, the local council wants to move her. It seems that the individual and their needs and their fears and concerns um, is outweighed with regards to the cost and the financial issues. Government spending on mental health is falling far short of what it should be, according to a cross-party group headed by the Conservative MP Andrew Mitchell, Labour's Alistair Campbell and Norman Lamb of the Lib Dems. The bottom line is there is an injustice within the NHS. You don't get the same access to treatment if you've got mental ill health. And how can we possibly tolerate that? <laughs> so another day of warnings about the NHS and difficult decisions ahead for the government. The Department of Health, which covers England, said tough economic decisions had been taken to allow extra investment in the NHS and more funding had been pledged for mental health. But the demands for urgent intervention in health and social care are becoming increasingly vocal ahead of the Chancellor's autumn statement next week. Hugh Pym, BBC News, Whitehall. Retail sales have grown at their fastest annual rate for 14 years. The Office for National Statistics said that sales figures for last month were up nearly 7.5% on the previous year, and almost to 2% on September. What does it tell us? Let's talk to our economics editor, Kamal Ahmed. And it tells us that maybe again we're back to this theme that the, uh, the gloomy predictions just before Brexit have been proved wrong again. Possibly, Hugh. I think what they do say is that the consumer is feeling very confident at the moment. I think there's a number of reasons for that. Firstly, of course, borrowing is very cheap, record low uh, interest rates. Employment levels are high, so people who have jobs uh, feel pretty comfortable. And of course, inflation, that inflation risk that people thought would start crystallising in the economy, hasn't come to pass as yet. There are some short-term factors in the retail sales today. We've had a pretty warm autumn. 
and then it suddenly turned a little bit colder. People have rushed out to buy their winter wardrobes. And actually, we oddly spend a lot more on Halloween uh, than we used to. So those are some of the figures that are being boosted up. But I think an element of caution about what could be happening ahead. That inflation risk could increase, add sterling falls. It costs Britain more to import food and fuel into the country. So inflation starts rising then gently into next year. Then the Bank of England considers that it might have to raise interest rates to control that inflation. One thing that we have to remember, borrowing is at levels now on credit cards, personal loans, that it was just before the financial crisis when we thought that personal debt was a real problem. If there is an increase in, in inflation, if there is an increase in interest rates, people start feeling squeezed. That confidence could dissipate really quickly. This might not be economic pain cancelled. It might be economic pain delayed. OK, come on. Again, thanks very much. Come on, Lomendev. Now, President Obama has urged his successor, Donald Trump, to stand up to Russia if it deviates from what he called American values and international norms. Mr Obama was speaking in Berlin on his last visit to Germany as president, where he also warned against a cyber arms race, saying that there was clear proof that Russia had engaged in cyber attacks. Our North America editor, John Sopel, has more details. The red carpets will still be rolled out and the plane will remain the same. It's just that in two months' time, it'll be someone else coming down the steps of Air Force One. Barack Obama has enjoyed his closest international relationship with the German Chancellor Angela Merkel, and the president was in slightly carefree mode as he walked through Berlin this morning. Sun came out. Not bad, huh? But the message to his successor about Russia couldn't have been more deadly serious. My hope is, is that uh, he does not simply take a real politic approach and suggest that you know, if we just cut some deals with Russia, uh, even if it hurts people or even if it violates international norms or even if it leaves smaller countries vulnerable uh, or creates long-term problems uh, in regions like Syria, that we just do whatever is convenient at the time. Russian planes have again been in action over the skies of Syria today. The current administration is furious at the way Moscow is behaving, here and in Ukraine. But during the election campaign, Donald Trump repeatedly spoke warmly about Vladimir Putin, bringing these sharp exchanges. I don't know Putin. He said nice things about me. If we got along well, that would be good. Well, that's because he'd rather have a puppet as president of no the United puppet. States. No puppet. And it's pretty clear. You're the puppet. It's and the man sitting round the table here with Vladimir Putin is General Mike Flynn, the man tipped to be Donald Trump's national security adviser. One person who will be playing no part in the next administration is James Clapper, the head of US national intelligence. The man who publicly accused Russia of intervening directly in the election by hacking into Democratic Party computers has said he'll step down when the president leaves office. I uh, submitted my letter of resignation last night, which felt pretty good. I got uh, 64 days left. The comings and goings of would-be cabinet members at Trump Tower have carried on throughout the day at a dizzying pace, all waiting to get the nod. One of those who's been in to see Donald Trump today is Henry Kissinger, the former Secretary of State from the Nixon and Ford eras. No, the 93-year-old is not touting for a new job. He's there to give advice. And on the subject of Russia and the threat it poses, his views are much more closely aligned to the current president rather than Donald Trump. John Sopel, BBC News, Washington. Well, tomorrow, President Obama will be meeting European leaders to discuss the possible extension of sanctions against Russia uh, over its actions in Ukraine. Let's talk to our Europe editor, Katja Adler, in Brussels. Um, and Katja, I suppose one of the risks is that they might agree something which Donald Trump disagrees with and might try to unpick. Well, that is their worry, Hugh. And tonight, Barack Obama did call, as we heard there on Donald Trump, and said, you have to stand up to Russia if it deviates from what he called US values and international norms. But Germany's Angela Merkel and the other European leaders in Berlin don't just worry about Russia deviating from international norms. They're concerned about Donald Trump, more dealmaker than diplomat, more poker player than experienced politician. But theirs is the view of old Europe. And old Europe is teetering and waiting in the wings 
are Europe's political equivalents of Donald Trump, more anti-establishment and nationalist minded. This is a hugely symbolic moment, Hugh. If you look at those leaders in Berlin, most of them are either on their way out or desperately focused on domestic affairs. The only one in a political position to push for international visions is Angela Merkel, driven by the shadows of Germany's Nazi past and the Cold War. She was damaged at home by the migrant crisis, but she's still a favourite to win elections in Germany next year. And that is why Barack Obama chose Berlin as his last foreign visit. But he shouldn't hold his breath. Angela Merkel is more pragmatist than visionary. And because of its past, Germany has to be very careful about stamping too forcefully on the world stage. Katja, once again, thanks very much. Katja Adler, there, our Europe editor in Brussels with the latest there. Now, teams of scientists based in the UK and the USA say they've made a major breakthrough which could have significant implications for standards of crop production and food security in the developing world. Researchers use genetic modification to increase the amount of energy from sunlight that plants can then channel into growth. Our science correspondent, Victoria Gill, has more details. Growing crops to feed us all. But there's a looming crisis how to grow enough for an ever-expanding global population. Millions of people in developing countries already go hungry. This is really just a straightforward response to a step change. So researchers have found a way to manipulate photosynthesis, the process by which plants use sunlight to make sugars that fuel their growth. Photosynthesis is arguably the most important biological process on our planet. It's the source of all of our food and in Trying to understand how it works, we've realised there are many inefficiencies in our crops. The light's very controlled in this lab greenhouse, but outside when the sunlight is very intense and it could damage plants, they can switch into a protective mode where they release that additional energy that could harm them as heat. The problem is that when the cloud gathers, they stay in that protective heat-releasing mode for a long time. With a genetic tweak, these scientists have essentially allowed the plants to switch back when they need to, so a leaf can go back into channeling all of the sunlight it needs into photosynthesis. This one genetic change made an experimental tobacco crop grow larger, faster. The same change in edible crops, researchers say, could be the start of a much-needed food production revolution. This can really answer this issue of providing 70% more food by 2050 and particularly providing more productive crops for the areas of the world where food shortages are likely to be most acute. Genetically modifying these plants has revealed exactly which building blocks or genes make a plant use more sunlight. But there'll be no subsequent genetic modification of our food. The challenge instead will be to find ways to enhance this process naturally in the crops that we eat. We need to have a lot of techniques that can be used to address the problem. Uh, I do understand public concerns. GM is just part of the toolbox that allows us to, to demonstrate the effectiveness of the targets we're looking at. It will be at least another two decades before we see the results of this research growing in farmers' fields. But scientists say this is a critical step to growing our way out of a worldwide problem. Victoria Gill, BBC News. Let's have a brief look then at uh, some of the day's other news stories now. Prison officers have warned the government that they may take further industrial action if their concerns over rising levels of violence in jails are not addressed. Thousands stopped work on Tuesday in protest. The Prison Officers Association said its talks with the Justice Secretary today were positive. A leaked report suggests the Alliance for Direct Democracy, a group in the European Parliament which includes UKIP, may have to pay back tens of thousands of pounds, which it's claimed UKIP wrongly spent on its general election and referendum campaigns. UKIP says it is being victimised. Strong winds have caused disruption in parts of Wales and the Midlands. Uh, there were reports of tornadoes in the seaside town of Aberystwyth where several caravans were overturned. Winds of up to 94 miles an hour were recorded bringing down trees and leaving hundreds of homes without power. Football's world governing body, FIFA, says it's opened disciplinary proceedings against England and Scotland after players wore armbands with poppies during last Friday's World Cup qualifier. FIFA says poppies are considered to be political symbols and they're banned from matches. 
In France, next year's presidential election could be won by Marine Le Pen, leader of the National Front. According to the Prime Minister, Manuel Valls, he said that Donald Trump's victory in the US had given momentum to Le Pen's campaign and he warned that France's traditional parties were ignoring the danger. The fragile economy in France and the continued threat of terror attacks have severely weakened the popularity of the president, François Hollande, as our Paris correspondent, Lucy Williamson, reports now. Some leaders talk about unity, all too aware that divisions have grown over jobs, immigration, security, the role of Islam. With Francois Hollande, now its least popular post-war president, France is heading for change. The centre-right opposition party is about to choose the candidate they hope will beat the far-right leader Marine Le Pen to the presidency next year. One man has already campaigned against her, and her father too. But Nicolas Sarkozy has always been the Marmite of French politics. In a bid to woo voters, he's proposed banning the Muslim veil and locking up terror suspects without trial. Critics say he's sailing too close to Marine Le Pen. That's what journalists say. It's not at all what the people think. We have nothing in common. I'm the one who has been criticised most by the far right. I've always refused to have a deal with them, so it doesn't match reality. If Madame Le Pen says she prefers nice weather to rain, then I share that value. Donald Trump's success in America is a reminder that Mr Sarkozy may be reading the right-wing mood here better than his opponents. But this primary isn't just for party members. It's open to anyone who says they share right-wing or centrist values. And that's far more unpredictable. He's already been president once before, but Nicolas Sarkozy hasn't had an easy return. He's having to fight hard to win his party's approval to enter the race again. The current favourite to win the nomination is the centrist Alain Juppé, who describes Mr Sarkozy's security proposals as a French Guantanamo. A trip to a World War I museum in northern France seemed like a good time to ask him about relations with the UK. What would they look like if he became president? Great Britain has chosen to leave the European Union. We have now to endorse this decision, but also to maintain good relations between our two countries. How far are you prepared to go to maintain those good relations? How much will, will you give? As far as it will be reasonable to go. <laughs> Thank you. Many voters say they're supporting Mr Juppé in order to keep more right-wing politicians from power. As France absorbs the news of the US election result, many are wondering whether the wave of populism might be headed here. The two-round voting system here tends to keep electoral shocks in check. But after Britain chose Brexit and America chose Trump, France is braced for surprises. Lucy Williamson, BBC News, Paris. Well, the uh, new home of Britain's Design Museum will open to the public a week today. The original was set up by the designer Sir Terence Conran in an old warehouse on the banks of the Thames, but its new home in the former Commonwealth Institute in West London is much bigger uh, and funded largely by private donations, and Sir Terence is one of the biggest contributors. Our arts correspondent David Silito has been to take a look. This is more than just a beautiful new building. It is, in many ways, a personal project by a man who helped change the way we live. Sir Terence Conran. Hmm. How did you feel when you walked in? Oh. This is the great day of my life. To see the place <laughs> actually finished. Over the years, through his shops and designs, he introduced millions to a new, continental way of living. French cookware, flat-pack furniture, duvets. And the inspiration for it all was a design exhibition, the Festival of Britain. Working here as a young industrial artist changed his life. I just saw the faces of people coming in in their long Macintoshes with their sandwiches and the smiles. 
They hadn't seen anything cheerful for so long. 65 years on, that Festival of Britain's spirit lives on. It asks many questions about how we'll deal with change. For instance, robots. How comfortable are we going to be with them, especially when they're interacting with us? I think he's following me around, isn't he? But also, how comfortable are we going to be in a changing world? European culture and talent has helped British design to blossom. It's an industry reliant on international relationships. London is the global hub of creativity. And, you know, the sooner government realises this and, you know, demonstrates its enthusiasm for design, the better. A shrine then to the ideas that have changed the world and the role played by Britain. David Solito, BBC News. Uh, a quick reminder for you that Newsnight's about to begin on BBC Two. Here's Evan. It sounds like an odd question, but tonight we're asking if Germany is the new leader of the West. President Obama's been there today talking as though he believes it is in the post-Brexit, post-Trump world. Do you agree? Join me now on BBC Two, 11pm in Scotland. That's Newsnight with Evan here on BBC One. It's time for the news where you are. Have a good night.